morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone joining us from around the world. We have about 500 people registered for this webinar today. My name is Rick Richman, and I am a resident scholar at American Jewish University. And this is the seventh in the seven-part series jointly presented by the Middle East Forum and AJU on the multi-front war against Israel from Iran, Gaza, the West Bank, Lebanon, Iraq, Syria, and today's subject of Yemen. Yemen may be the least well understood front, but it is fast growing into one of the most important. The Houthis in Yemen have fired missiles against Israel, threatened to send tens of thousands of troops to join the fight against it, disrupted shipping in one of the key waterways in the world, sunk at least two ships and targeted other ships from both the United States and the United Kingdom using ballistic missiles, drones, and unmanned sea craft packed with explosives. And since last November, after Hamas initiated the Gaza war, the Pentagon has recorded more than 190 attacks on U.S. military vessels or commercial shipping, including nearly 100 since the U.S. retaliatory strike started in January. We're pleased to have with us today Michael Rubin, the Director of Policy Analysis at the Middle East Institute and a distinguished senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He specializes in Iran, Iraq, and other countries in the region, and he has extensive experience in the Pentagon and as an academic in Yemen, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran, which give him a unique perspective on the region and its issues. He's taught U.S. Navy and Marine units about regional conflicts and terrorism, and he's authored many important books and articles. He holds three degrees from Yale, including a Ph.D. in history, and he continues to provide analysis to the U.S. Army's training and doctrine command. We couldn't have a better person to analyze the front in Yemen. I'm going to turn it over to Michael for a presentation that will last about 10 to 15 minutes, after which he and I will have a brief colloquy, and then we'll turn to your questions, which you can put in the Q&A function on your screen. Thank you, Michael, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, just one quick correction. I'm at the Director of Policy Analysis at the Middle East Forum. We're the ones that support Israel and are against Iran, as opposed to the Middle East Institute, and I'll just leave it there. Thank um, you. That said, while well, normally in my time in the Pentagon taught me that PowerPoint was the work of Satan, I'm going because Yemen is a little bit more complex and fewer people are familiar with Yemen. I am going to show a few slides. And so I'm going to disappear from the screen for a second while I share, um, I, I share, um, uh, some maps of Yemen, and so forth. Everyone should be able to see this right now. A few things to understand about Yemen. Of course, it's at the uh, base of the Arabian Peninsula. It's traditionally been divided. During the Cold War, it was divided into two, North Yemen and South Yemen, which you see there. But scholars actually have a debate about whether the natural divisions in Yemen should be two, should be six, or even as many as 30 some people have, have made. The late great historian Bernard Lewis had pointed out that when you have topography, difficult terrain and so forth, that's where traditionally the minorities took refuge because as the Kurds say in a different context, they have no friends but the mountains. It is absolutely no coincidence that the Jews and the Houthis, this Shia offshoot sect, have all taken refuge at various times in North Yemen, in fact, in the same district called Sada, which you see up in the top of North Yemen um, on this map. I should also say, just by way of illustrating how difficult topographically Yemen is, Sana, the capital of Yemen, is around 7,500 feet above sea level. That's higher than Denver, that's higher than El Paso. Um, you actually get the monsoon rains, much like in India, in Sana itself. I've been caught in a flood there, 
And at the same time, you actually have a native species of baboon in some of the jungles of Yemen, which isn't what people normally think of when they think about the Arabian Peninsula. Putting that aside, back in the 1970s, I believe in 1978, Ali Abdullah Saleh came to power in Yemen. And he likened political control to dancing on the heads of snakes. Most people, including our Central Intelligence Agency, gave him about six months. After all, Yemen at the time was much like Syria, where he kept constantly having coups. But Saleh managed to consolidate power, and he stayed in power until around 2012. He was the longest serving Arab dictator, if you will, and he did it by controlling Yemen with brute force. Um, after he um, was ousted, Abdurrahim, Abdurrabu Mansour Hadi, I'll just call him Hadi, took over. Now, here's the thing. When you look at this map of Yemen, you see North Yemen, you see South Yemen. North Yemen looks far smaller, but about six times the population lives in North Yemen as South Yemen. Many of you might remember back in around 1994, there was a civil war. Let me back up. At the end of the Cold War, South Yemen collapsed and Yemen unified, much like Germany did. However, in 1994, South Yemen decided, you know, we don't like being dominated by North Yemen. And so they tried to secede again. There was a civil war and the civil war failed. When I was driving the next year, from the south to the north, I saw guns in Lahij, anti-aircraft guns, pointed to the north. And I asked one of my southern colleagues about it, and he said, well, we haven't turned around the guns because we might need them for the next fight. At any rate, you have um, this dynamic between the north, which is much more populous, and the south. In order to try to smooth this over, Ali Abdullah Saleh agreed to take a vice president from the south. Another way to think about this in an American analogy would be imagine having California and Delaware or California and Rhode Island. That's the, that's the analogy between North Yemen and South Yemen. South Yemen is the Rhode Island, North Yemen is the Texas or the California or the New York. At any rate, so Abdul, Ali Abdullah Saleh agreed to take the Southerner as vice president to give a patina of unity never expected that the vice president would actually take over. But Ali Abdullah Saleh fell. Ultimately, he tried to come back with the Houthis. He was a cynic. He danced on the heads of snakes. But he was ultimately assassinated. And when he died, um, Hadi took over. Now, here's the problem. No one outside the presidential palace really ever expected a southerner to become president, and no one gave him any heed. He had to take a northern general under his wing. And if he ever wanted to leave the palace, he had to have this general, General Ali Mohsen al Hamar, sort of escort him. And this, this just shows you the dysfunction of the state. Now, another way to look at this, when we look at this today, after the Houthis invaded, they put an end to this notion that there was a unified government under Hadi's control, or today under Rashid Alimi's control. The Houthis came in, they took over Sana, they took over the populous area, and then the United Arab Emirates helped create the Southern Transitional Council, which took over the Southern area. And some of the other areas, they basically don't matter because the internationally recognized government controls them, but no one lives there. It's like the internationally recognized government controlling only a few counties in rural Iowa or something like that. Now, what are the Houthis and this threat they pose? Now, the big question is, are the Houthis an Iranian puppet? The Houthis are actually a tribal unit in Yemen. They are religiously called Zaydis, and Zaydis are sort of like a cross between the Sunnis and the Shiites. They are technically Shiite, but their theology is much more like the Sunnis. However, back in 1986, the head of this tribe, so I'm going to use the tribal name, the Houthis, decided to go to Iran to get training. This is much like what Hezbollah did in southern Lebanon. And in this background photo, you can actually see pictures of Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah. The Houthis managed to gain a lot of weaponry. 
That's not a big deal. In Yemen, there is a lot of weaponry floating around. In 1995, four years after the liberation of Kuwait and Operation Desert Storm, I went to an arms market and I saw boxes of weaponry property of the United States government. That said, while there might be uh, bazookas, there might be uh, Kalashnikovs, there might be tanks, there weren't anti-ship missiles needed or available in the mountains of Yemen. So they have to be getting in from somewhere. And the way they're getting in is either by sea, through the, the Baba Mandab. I'm pointing at it as if you can see me, but the Baba Mandab is what, that strategic choke point. And this is one of the reasons why it's so important that the Houthis control one of the main ports here. It also explains why the Iranians have an intelligence gathering vessel, because they want to know who should pass and who shouldn't. If they want to get weaponry to the Houthis, they want to make sure that the Houthis don't attack the wrong fishing ship or cargo ship that's bringing this sort of weaponry. The Houthis rose up in rebellion, and you know, the Saudis actually have something to answer for here. What the Saudis did, being Saudis, is even though the Houthis were basically sort of like Sunnis, even though technically they weren't quite like the way the Saudis practiced, the Saudis started beaming in, broadcasting sectarian propaganda, and it sort of created the a dynamic of the other. So the Houthis basically rallied around. Some people asked whether the Iranians created the Houthis. No, I don't think they did. But the Iranians are never one to let a good crisis go to, la to waste and they understood how they should co-opt the Houthis. So are the Houthis an Iranian puppet today? I would say absolutely. And don't just listen to me, listen to the Iranians. Here's Ayatollah Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, speaking in May 2015. We will support every innocent and oppressed person. Today, the people of Yemen have been oppressed. There is no oppression which is more severe than killing Muslims. The month of Rajab is a month where no one should be killed. Even the pagans in Mecca used to stop wars on this month. The people of Yemen are an oppressed people. The people of Bahrain are an oppressed people. The people of Palestine are subject to severe oppression. We support the oppressed as much as we can. We support them within the scope of our capabilities because it is our responsibility to do so. So said Ayatollah Khamenei. Lest you not believe him, Ali Shirazi, who's the Supreme Leader's personal representative to the Quds Force, said, and I quote, the Houthis are a version of Hezbollah, and this group will use the stage for confronting the enemies of Islam. But that's 2015. What about now? On January 16th, 2024, again, Ali Khamenei, the Supreme Leader of Iran, said, Yemen's blow to the Zionist regime's lifeline is admirable. He's referring to the attacks on the shipping in the Bab al Mandab through which about 10% of world trade fits. So are the Houthis an Iranian puppet? I would say they are. Now, do the Houthis pose a real threat? This is, of course, slide you can see I took from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. But what you're seeing there is only between 2016 and 2021. Those blobs you see on the maps are attacks by missiles from Yemen, from the Houthis. So again, we ask, where are they getting the missiles? Some by sea, from, some by land through Oman. But one thing that's certain is they're hitting across Saudi Arabia. And we also know that they've since hit the United Arab Emirates, and they've openly talked about striking at a lot, striking at Israel. How does this come into the Seven Front War? When you actually look at Houthi propaganda, they will actually talk about how their job is to stop fuel from going to Israel, just like Hezbollah's job in the north, in the eastern Mediterranean, is to do the same thing. What we're seeing is a blockade no different than the, the Soviet blockade of Berlin during the Cold War. It's a blockade launched by Israel, uh, sorry, launched by Iran through various proxies so they can have plausible deniability. And one of those most important proxies is also Yemen. The other things to be aware of, of course, is Yemen is not only the site of where the Iranians are trying to create a base, but it's the site of where both al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and the Islamic State have tried to create a base. And in fact, the USS Cole attack, the Charlie Hebdo massacre in Paris, were all run and controlled through Yemen. Now, what? how does the United Arab Emirates fit in? 
they are basically trying to take over. Sorry, let me stop the share at this point. They're trying to take over uh, the South in order to defeat the Houthis. We can talk about giving the Houthis aid, like we can talk about giving Hamas aid. The problem is the Houthis control the main port. So in effect, what we're doing is virtue signaling with the American taxpayer dollar in a way that's not helping a single Yemeni, but rather is flowing into the coffers of a group which is attacking international shipping. This plain and simple is about an axis of resistance run by Supreme Leader Khamenei, operated by the Quds Force, which is the main terrorist group within the Islamic Republic of Iran. And their specific mission set is to help tighten the noose around Israel. This is what the West is up against. This is what Israel's up against. But it doesn't just impact Israel. There are only so many strategic choke points in the world. The Baba Mandab is perhaps one of the most important because you're killing two birds with one stone, because you're also strangling not only Israel, but the Suez Canal traffic, which brings about $9 billion a year into Egyptian coffers. So the question is, we can send our Eisenhower carrier strike group away because of the crisis in Lebanon, but are we just allowing, in a way, playing whack-a-mole? And are we signaling that we actually don't care what happens in the Red Sea anymore? And if that's the case, are we snatching defeat from the jaws of victory by empowering the Houthis at a time when um, arguably they could be starved? Are we also allowing playing into Iran's long game? And I'll conclude here by fighting the tentacles of Iran rather than fighting the head of the octopus. Are we confusing the, to make another metaphor? Are we, are we looking at the trees rather than the forest? This is all directed by the Islamic Republic of Iran. The Iranians, forget our diplomats. If you listen to what the Quds Force itself says, they will acknowledge that the Houthis are no different than Hezbollah. If we want to argue that, look, the Iranians don't directly control the Houthis, we should have put that argument to rest with regard to Hezbollah. We should have put that argument to rest with some of the militias inside Iraq. The fact is, we're like Lucy with the football and Charlie Brown, making the same mistake, I mean, as Charlie Brown, making the same mistake each time and not understanding the way the world in this region is actually working. But with that, let me turn the floor back to you, Rick. Thank you, Michael. Let me let me ask you a couple of questions. One about um, where the Houthis fit in the seven front war against Israel, and then come back to the point you just made about the larger war between Iran and and, and the West. With respect to the the war against Israel, we, we've treated this series as seven fronts, and we have analyzed each front. Um, my question is: last, last month there was a combined attack by the Houthis and the um, Iraqi militia supported by Iran. And they struck with missiles Ashdod and um, uh, uh, Haifa. And the Houthis have struck several times at a lot, a strategic Israeli city as well. So that's three cities. My question to you is whether maybe we're making a conceptual mistake here in treating these as seven fronts. Maybe these are fronts that are preparing for a combined seven-front attack on Israel. And we disregard some of these attacks as being ineffectual because they do no damage or no significant damage. Um, but maybe they are designed to test Israeli reaction and to test American reaction in preparation for a larger war. What's your reaction to that? You know, I, I absolutely agree that we are making a conceptual mistake. I would also argue that some of the analysis surrounding that direct military confrontation between Israel and Iran uh, went askew. Now, Iran and its proxies, including the Houthis, launched more than 300 missiles, um, drones, and so forth at Israel, and all but seven were shot down, and many in the West saw this as a great victory. But imagine if any of those had biological, chemical, or nuclear warheads then seven out of 300 getting through isn't such a great victory uh, in a country as small as Israel. When Israel retaliated, many Americans said, 
the fact that Israel was able to knock out with precision some S-300 batteries, some anti-aircraft batteries outside of Isfahan showed that Israel spoke softly but carried a big stick. But that's assuming that we care with the same sort of technicality um, that, or that the Iranians care and are judging deterrence with the same metric. The problem is that the Iranians, those who support the Supreme Leader, only believe what the Supreme Leader said. What they saw with the attack in Israel was a demonstration from their point of view of Iranian strength. What they saw when Israel responded was absolutely nothing because the Iranians denied reality. They denied that S-300s were struck. And so rather than shatter Iranian confidence among those that true that believe in the circle of sycophancy around the Supreme Leader, they actually believe that Israel is on the defensive, that Israel's back is against the wall and that their strategy is working. And you're absolutely right. The fact that we misconceive of the Iranian strategy, because we're blinded by our own projection of how we organize things, actually plays into Iranian hands. It plays into Houthi hands. Let me ask you about the respective uh, responses to this front uh, by the Trump and the Biden administrations. And I want to take you back to 2019, when there was a very substantial attack on the Saudi Arabia oil facilities. The Houthis claimed credit for it, responsibility for it. The American intelligence community reportedly said it was Iran. Iran itself denied it and said, look, the Houthis are claiming responsibility for it. It was at that time, I'm sure you recall, that President Trump said that the United States was locked and loaded to respond to Iran, and then nothing happened to the shock, reportedly, of Saudi and perhaps some of our other allies. What's your analysis of what happened back then? Well, Rick, I think your analysis, what you stated, again, is correct. Washington, we may judge our policy um, by our rhetoric, and we may believe our own spin. It's dangerous when Republicans do it. It's dangerous when Democrats do it. But unfortunately, there's a pattern of everyone doing it. What isn't very public is that there was an attack using drones, an attempt using drones by Iraqi militias to take down the Burj Khalifa, the world's largest building in the United Arab Emirates. When that happened, the um, President Macron in France was on the phone right away to the Emiratis saying, your soil is our soil. We will come to your defense. We're here for whatever you need. It took the Biden administration more than 20 days to react that shattered confidence in the region, that America had anyone's back. And therefore, it's no surprise that people in the region are pivoting for alternatives. Um, look, it's a conceit of both Republican and Democratic administrations that when we engage in foreign policy, it's basically us and our partners in the sandbox. But the world is much larger and Russia and China are moving in as we, as we um, vacate our sense of leadership. And indeed, Vladimir Putin has publicly molded whether or not he should give anti-shipping missiles uh, to the Houthis as well. Okay, so let me take you now to uh, the Biden administration. On the way out, the Trump administration listed the Houthis um, as a foreign terrorist organization. In the first 10 days, the Biden administration revoked that designation. And since then has provided, as you noted, significant humanitarian aid to the areas of Yemen that are controlled by the Houthis. It's in the last three years alone, it's been about a billion dollars. And reportedly it cost us about a billion dollars so far in military expenditures in largely ineffectual retaliatory uh, strikes against the Houthis. So on the one hand, we're, we're, we're spending a billion dollars on military strikes against the Houthis. And on the other hand, we're sending a billion dollars of humanitarian aid. How does that combination make strategic sense? Well, it doesn't. Um, look, at the beginning, one of the first actions of the Biden administration was to lift sanctions on the Houthis. And this is what I mean by Washington navel gazing. Everything revolves around us. And we can't conceive that our the, the, the enemy is never our enemy. It's always our, our predecessor in the White House. Democrats do it again. Republicans do it. It's an unfortunate trajectory. And this just bought 
the Houthis more time, the Iranians more time. They see us as tremendously naive. And this isn't just conjecture. I, I talk to them. Now, when it comes to um, the aid, the main port in northern Yemen is called Hudaydah. And it's just above the Bab al-Mandab in the Red Sea. Um, you may recall that several years ago, the Iranians started mining ships off the, off the ports of the United Arab Emirates. The timing of that was when the United Arab Emirates was talking about going in and liberating Hudaydah. And of course, there was the usual propaganda on college campuses saying this is going to be a humanitarian tragedy. It's going to pause delivery of humanitarian aid. The same sort of logic that we hear when we're told you can't take Rafa. Uh, the tunnels need to stay open. We need to actually support our enemies, even if Hamas takes and channels the, the money away. The people who control the main port in Yemen are the Houthis. If we are giving... $40 million of aid a year or whatever it is. I mean, a billion total. We are actually channeling that money to the Houthis. We can pretend that they are distributing it fairly across Yemen. But if you read the same United Nations reports that say there's tremendous starvation in Yemen, what you will see is that the Houthis, for example, refuse to give they use food as weapons. They refuse to distribute aid to those that don't subordinate themselves to their unrecognized government. It really is a complete dissonance of policy, and it only plays into the Iranian hands. We're not thinking with strategic clarity. Uh, let, let me turn to questions from the audience. We, we've got a number of them here. Um, this one is from someone whose initials are J.I., uh, it's the basic question. How can the Houthis be defeated? Okay. Number one, instead of it takes 4,000 people to crew a Nimitz class aircraft carrier like the USS Eisenhower, it takes four people to crew an Osprey, one of these sort of planes that takes off like a helicopter and then turns into a plane. Ospreys move much faster than aircraft carriers. We have an airfield in Berbera, in the breakaway region of Somaliland. It used to be a space shuttle landing, um, emergency landing strip, but the State Department won't let us use it because they're afraid of insulting Mogadishu. Who the heck, I'm watching my language now, who the heck gives a hoot, but I'm not thinking hoot, about what the Somalis think in Mogadishu? Somaliland and this airfield, it's like the Iraqi Kurdistan, um, it's analogous to Iraqi Kurdistan in Iraq. It's been its own government for, um, 30 years. Even the British are there. And Tony Blinken stands on ceremony and says, oh, we've got to put Somali national interests above our own. It's shameful. How else can they be de defeated? Look, just like Qatar perhaps crosses the line as an intermediary with regard to the Taliban, with regard to Hamas. I mean, when we're using intermediaries that are biased and actually want to see our adversaries win, it's a sign we're choosing long, the wrong intermediaries. Well, the Omanis have been the intermediary with the Houthis. And it's time to tell the Omanis, knock it off. We're not equivalent to them. And that if the Houthis want to starve, so be it. Then why do we tolerate Iranian intelligence ships determining and targeting for the Houthis which ship to hit and which not to hit? The first target on day one should have been that Iranian intelligence gathering ship. We could have done what Reagan did in Operation Praying Mantis and given them five or 10 minutes to evacuate. We will take them in lifeboats. We will save their lives. But that ship deserves to be on the bottom of the Bab al Mandab. We are in telegraphing seriousness. We, we only have time for one more question, but it, it follows on what you've just said. This one is from Barry Werner. Why didn't the US make a very strong response against Yemen right away? I guess it's probably a question you could extend to currently because eight months of retaliatory strikes have not, have not, don't seem to have been effective yet. Look, number one is because we're looking at the wrong target. And it's like three card Mont, terrorist three card Monty. We need to be focused on Iran. Iran is controlling it. The enemy is the Quds force. We should take out any Quds force communications by ship or personnel that exist 
in Yemen. We should be taking out the Houthis that exist anywhere else. But the fact of the matter is, maximum pressure works after Operation Praying Mantis, when Ronald Reagan first reflagged the Kuwaiti tankers and then retaliated when Iran continued to strike our ships. We got more than a decade, more than two decades of quiet. You know, what causes war in the Middle East isn't oil and it's not water. It's fundamental overconfidence. And we're giving every reason for the Quds Force, for the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, and for the Houthis to be overconfident. That needs to stop now. Unfortunately, we have to stop right now with, with this, but I want to end by thanking uh, Greg Roman of the Middle East Forum uh, for providing such uh, uh, great experts, including Michael Rubin of the Middle East Forum uh, for this seven-part series. We probably could have gone on for a second half hour in each. You've given us a lot to think about. So thank you, Michael, for this presentation. Thank you, Greg and Daniel Pipes, for your work at the Middle East Forum. And thank you all for listening today.